Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Jungian scholar Dr. James Hollis. Dr. Hollis is a graduate of Zurich's Jung Institute, a licensed Jungian analyst practicing in Washington, D.C., and is the author of 15 books, including Living an Examined Life and one of Paul's favorite books, Tracking the Gods, The Place of Myth in Modern Life. Well, uh, Dr. Hollis, what a what a pleasure to have you here and to share with me and my uh, listeners on Living 4D with Paul Check. I've uh, studied a fair bit of your work. You have an incredible number of books out there, so I know that you're a very, very busy man. I recently finished reading Tracking the Gods, which I found absolutely awesome. I was reading that book and over and over again, what kept coming to me in my mind was the painting that Jung did of Philemon and his conversations with Philemon. And I felt I am reading, I'm communicating through the, uh, the non-local mind with the archetype of the wise man. I feel that, that you embody that archetype very fully. And, um, I went through a midlife crisis myself when I turned 50. I'm 57 now. It took me about three years to get through it. And I came across your Into the Dark Wood audio program, and it turned out to be a great resource because I had uh, two or three clients also going through midlife crisis, and I was really very much appreciative for the depth and the clarity that you brought to the issues of midlife crisis in that program, and I was just overjoyed when you responded to me with interest in sharing with me today. So I just want to start by saying thank you for your amazing work and thank you for the clarity that you bring to myth and many confusing subjects such as the soul and uh, all the other issues that are often confusing in psychology and spirituality and religion and metaphysics. So uh, today... Uh, even though I, my real desire is to dive deep into myth with you, there's so many terms that confuse people. And I myself have studied world religion extensively and all aspects of that and Jung's work and Steiner's work. And oftentimes these terms are actually used differently, as I'm sure you know, by different authors. For example, if you read Steiner and parallel, parallel that with reading of Jung, their descriptions of certain elements of things like soul or the I or even God can vary enough that it can confuse people. So my dream is that if we could start today by using your broad depth of uh, knowledge and wisdom to help bring some clarity to terms, I feel that might be the most important groundwork to do so that when we're as we begin talking about other things, people have a clear understanding of what you're saying to us. How does that sound with you? That sounds fine, Paul. And uh, by the way, I have no claim to uh, wisdom. I'm just another sojourner in this uh, sort of spinning planet and uh, asking questions along the way. So uh, if we approach it in that kind of uh, spirit, I think we'll, we'll be fine here. Um, well, yeah, I, I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate your statement, but uh, I can say from my own perspective you may not have a claim to it, but it, a lot of it passes through the vessel you called uh, Dr. Hollis. <laughs> it's, it, uh, let's just say I'm, I'm channeling the insights of many people, and that's appropriate for a teacher, which is really what my primary identification is. That's perfect. Well, the first uh, thing I'd like to help get some clarification on, it's something I've talked about a lot, but I'm interested in your opinion People use the word God, and as you know, it's a very dangerous term because it has as many meanings as there are people on the planet, it seems. And so what I would like is if you could share your uh, how you would express or define God as the absolute versus mm -hmm. God, like the God of Christianity or the God of Islam versus little G-O-D, like the gods in myth. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we start with a difficult question, right? Sure. That's, that's probably the most difficult of all because the concept, the idea of God is in itself a transcendent uh, or description of a transcendent other that is in so many ways unknowable. Right. It's, you know, in common parlance, it's, it's our word for that which uh, 
you know, transcends the human condition and uh, understands uh, something that of which we're only dimly aware at best. Um, when, when Jung uses a term, it obviously depends on the context. Um, so in, in talking about the book Tracking the Gods, essentially what I was saying there is when we ask ourselves what happened to Zeus and Hera and Aphrodite and so forth, they, they were gods and revered as such by you know, vast numbers of people. Where did they go? And, and Jung answered that question in a generic sense. Um, when he said they, they left Mount Olympus and entered the, the, the soul of the modern. And, and what he was really saying was, what is transcended to us is the encounter with numinous energy. Now, numinous energy is energy that confronts us, that moves us, that shakes us, that disturbs us, that uh, changes our world for good or for ill. And uh, then because it's autonomous, it has the power to leave a certain image. And so the, the concept is left behind. The husk, as it were, is left behind. And that's what happens when a, a god dies, which, you know, by definition is a contradiction in terms. A god is an immortal, but, you know, the world has been full of gods. So right. the, the real issue then was, if based on Jung's in, insight, is our task is to track those energies and see where they're found today. And you're right, they, they show up in all kinds of, um, first of all, the legacy of the great religions that have their understandings and definitions of God and so forth. And then we also can talk about cultural gods like materialism, because probably more people organize their life around the search for material abundance than any other single value, at least in the Western world. So you could say it's operating in a, a godlike form to individuals, as long as you understand what that means metaphorically. Right. But part of what Jung was doing was critiquing not God, which is that transcendent other, but our images of God. So when he wrote a book on uh, called Answer to Job, where he engages with the problem of evil in the book of Job and so forth, what he was really doing was saying, you know, the Western religions, unfortunately, split off the darker sides of, of existence, including evil, from their concept of the Godhead. And, and therefore, you know, where did, where did it go? And of course, it gets posited in a notion of a Satan or a devil figure and so forth. And that that uh, in itself, you know, see, is a kind of splitting. And, and then you have these sort of warring energies within. So good and evil are really human ego terms or conscious terms. Uh, you know, nature doesn't split. <laughs> Divinity no. doesn't yeah. split. It's the human ego that splits these things and to say good or evil. So if, if, you know, Jaws is hungry, it's not being a bad fish. I may have no. an opinion about it, whom he chooses to uh, dine on, but he's <laughs> just, being, just being a fishy fish. You know, that's yeah. he's what fish do at the moment. He's eating as we all consume. And it's only evil from the standpoint of my ego standpoint. So uh, Jung, Jung was asked this question later in his life, and he answered in a very oblique way, in a very sort of obscure way. And yet a compelling way. He said, I call God that which flings itself violently across my path and alters my conscious intentions for good or for ill. Yes, I've and read that. Meant, yeah, and I think what he meant by that is whatever radically requires us to transform our sense of self and other. Uh, so we can, we can fall in love, for example. And uh, people have historically talked about being possessed by Aphrodite, by the spirit of love. Uh, or possessed by Mars, a spirit of rage. What, is, what does that mean? It, it means to be in some way in relationship to an energy that's larger than the ordinary ego um, awareness or, or capacity to control. In those moments, we're in the presence of that energy. And of course, that energy can dissipate. As we know, we, we stop being angry, we fall out of love, we do all kinds of things. So what what is really transcended here is our encounter with the mysterious energies of the universe, some of whom we've identified or tried to personify as gods. And of course, when we do that, we're actually probably saying more about our own personal psychologies, our cultural references, our, our prejudices and biases and so forth, than we are saying about that transcendent other. A lot of that too is actually not even conscious behavior, it's program behavior. Most people in my observation, I've been a therapist now for 35 years, so I've had a lot of time to explore these things. But, you know, when you start getting fundamentalist Christians attacking various people or new age conceptions or whatever, 
you know, my observation is that most people's perceptions of, of what God is are programmed and they haven't honestly examined their own belief system, even when it's causing them tremendous trouble in their life. That's right. I had a friend years ago who was an adolescent psychologist, and he did a lot of studies on um, uh, teenagers' vision of God. And he found a one-to-one -one correlation between their family dynamics and their image of God. Was God benevolent, protective? Was God punitive, invasive? Was God abandoning? That sort of thing. And, and it was very clearly indicating what you just said, that we look at the world through a certain lens. And we think we're seeing the world as it is when only we're seeing what the lens allows us to see. And out of that, we formulate a, a sense of self and a sense of world. We have a picture that's always flawed in some way. Yes. You know, so as I'm listening to you talk, um, it makes me want to jump down my list a little because I've studied Nietzsche a fair bit. And you know, he had his statement, God is dead. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've studied symbology quite extensively. And, and I've also studied Jung's warnings of what happens when we turn a symbol into a sign. And it, it, what you're describing and what we're talking about right now, wouldn't that really fall right into the category of the transcendent being that which we can symbolize but cannot objectify? Mm -hmm. But religions and people make images and create definite meanings like, you know, this is what God expects of you. If you don't follow these commandments, you're going to burn in hell. If you don't stay married till death do you part, you're going to burn in hell. That, that's really signage, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a good example of, of Nietzsche. When Nietzsche said God is dead in the uh, 19th century, what he was doing, he wasn't making a theological statement or a metaphysical statement. He was making a cultural observation. He was looking around and seeing the people on the streets of Basel where he lived at the time and, and saw that they were, you know, serving certain creeds, certain forms of belief, but were not in some way in the presence of that mystery. Um, he, he felt that their tradition and their uh, dogmas and so forth, no matter how well intended, were essentially dead and, and not life-giving and, and not bringing them into proximity with, uh, with the sort of magnitude of the mystery. And he said, I, I could only imagine a, a religion of the dancing God, you know, by which he meant something that was dynamic, vital, spontaneous, and, and emergent, rather than codified in institutions and dogmas and rituals. Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting time. It seems to me that with the uh, saturation in the public, uh, worldwide, largely worldwide, with scientific materialism, that the new God or the recent God, the industrial age God that's now in the information age, seems to be consumerism. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what, what happens when you lose connection with the informing images of the past is the human psyche doesn't tolerate a vacuum very long. And so it will fill itself with ideas, shoddy thinking, um, and, and cultural surrogates. And the chief yes. cultural surrogates in our time were materialism, hedonism, and narcissism. You know, materialism saying, all right, if, if you feel disconnected and empty, you connect to a product of some kind, or you fill that emptiness with goods or something. Um, and and you, the whole point of this is about your self-absorption in yourself, rather than a sense of participation in a meaningful community. And, um, you know, it's... it's uh, <laughs> It's about pleasure as opposed to recognizing that many of our most pro profound um, experiences and meaningful experiences are found in the precincts of suffering. Yes, and that's, you know, that's a hard one for people to grasp. I have a concept I teach my students called the pain teacher, and it's, it's basically says that when pain shows up in your life, it's, it's an opportunity and it, it's a process in which consciousness is being awakened so that you can pay attention to what you're creating. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, we have this, as you know, heavily drug culture. We, we've been so programmed by the medical system and the drug manufacturers that any little itch, scratch, or bump needs to be drugged. And as a therapist who has spent a lot of time working with very, very injured people, one of the problems I always had is that the doctors drug these people so much that when I'm doing things like corrective exercises with them, I had to be very, very careful because I have no feedback loop anymore. And it's very easy to, you know, re-injure a disc or a 
tendon repair. And, and I think uh, going in line with what you're saying, we, we really need to carefully evaluate whether or not numbing out the feedback loop provided by pain is really doing us anything uh, beneficial at all. Well, there's a place for pain management when it becomes so uh, intractable that it's dominating one's life. On the other hand, you're right. Pain is what quickens consciousness. And um, in, a, in a book called Swamp Lands of the Soul years ago, I said, you know, from time to time, life is going to take us to these places that we don't want to visit, but we all have appointments uh, to places of depression, places of addiction, places of loss, places of betrayal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we'll feel victimized. We'll want to blame somebody, blame the universe, blame God, for example. Um, yes. In every one of them, there's a task. And, and to identify that task and to ask, what is my task here and how do I address that, allows one to move from a sense of victimage to active participation in one's life. Um, I'll give you a quick example. I, I ran into a gentleman some time ago who had had a catastrophic accident, was unable to resume his former life, and he was um, spending uh, some insurance settlement that had come his way in later life, uh, basically virtually paralyzed, but asking large questions of his life. And that's how he and I met and engaged and, and, and so forth. So, you know, it was a perfect illustration of having freedom and mobility taken away, which is horrible, of course. Yes. And yet underneath was this deep, deep desire for meaning. And, and so the question is, how can I address my legitimate curiosities and wonders in this world uh, given my relative uh, immobility and powerlessness, and he, and he used what powers he had to to engage in, with people. Yes. Now you know this this appointment that we have with the challenges in life, and uh, what I call the pain teacher, which is inevitable, as as we've both uh, discussed here. It reminds me of Edward Edinger's definition of consciousness, which I'll paraphrase: consciousness is a psychic substance produced not blindly, but in living awareness of opposites. Mm -hmm. And, and it, 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 you know, uh, I, I, as you can imagine, I have a lot of people's problems that I track right back to religious beliefs and Christianity being the dominant belief. And this split between good and evil, I often quote Isaiah 45, 7, which says, I form the light and the dark. I create good and evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And it's amazing how they, they don't want to look at that. And in fact, in recent editions of the Bible, they change that passage so it doesn't read quite so uh, potently. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, the point I'm making is I, I love Edward Edinger's definition of consciousness because it's, it's very uh, palpable, real, practical. And that exemplifies the fact that we, just as the Tai Chi symbol says, you know, yin and yang coexist together. You can't have one without the other, and we can't have the good without the less good or the happy without the sad. Mm -hmm. And that, that leads me, I'd really love to hear what you define consciousness versus the unconscious and the super consciousness, if you could share your views on that. Well, just to pursue your other line of thought for a moment here, consciousness sure. is based on the encounter with the opposite. We're, we're not born with consciousness, but in the first moments, there's something that has happened to us traumatically. We're no longer connected to the heartbeat of the universe. We are thrown into this world, assaulted by light and sound and gravity, and, and uh, you know, suffer a shock from which we never fully recover. It's in our neurology and it's in our psychic memory. But at the same time, you know, we have to begin dealing with the other. The other is parent from whom I'm now separated. The other is that world out there of which I have no knowledge. And so consciousness slowly is the accretion of minute shards of those split off experiences that begin to form in a kind of tidal pool, which slowly forms what we call the ego. We're not born with an ego, but, but we have to develop one. And the ego's chief function is to help us manage ourselves in the world with its various tasks and perils. And so um, along the way, we, we tend to identify who we are with ego consciousness rather than seeing the ego as, you know, a necessary um, a sort of differentiation in, in the psyche. 
I've, I've yes. said the ego, rather than being the boss or the chief executor, is, is actually a kind of floating disc in a large iridescent ocean, which I think really reproportions it properly to the unconscious, because the unconscious is nature naturing. And of course, consciousness is a burden in some way because it's based on the tension of opposites, the me and the not me. To become yes. aware of anything, I have to think in terms of what is and what is not present. And since that's difficult and painful, you can see why there's a desire to flee from, from consciousness. So if the infant could, it would climb back in the womb to that place of security, satiety, and nurturance, um, and absence of conflict, but it doesn't get that option. So it's forever looking for that out there. And you mentioned drugs and alcohol as an example. I mean, stop and think, what does it mean to get stoned? What does it mean to feel no pain? That, that's about the obliteration of consciousness. Yes. Uh, what does it mean to get high, <laughs> you see? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can try to flee consciousness in various ways. Fundamentalism is one of them. By Rather than deal with the complexity of real-life circumstances, um, one just fuzzes that over and says, well, this is right and this is wrong. And how do I know? Well, because somebody uh, told me so. You know, I've right. my authority to, to the group or whatever. And, and secondly, we can try to remain infantile and dependent upon others rather than show up and shut up and deal with the world as it really is. And, um, you know, we, we can also in, in some way uh, live a kind of unexamined life and just go with the flow, in which case you have to ask what, what are the agencies, you know, carrying you at this point? An awful lot is lived through reflexive response to things. Yes. You know, uh, there's two things I'd like to elaborate a little bit on, on based on your commentary there. Uh, one, you know, there, as I'm sure you're aware, a, a lot of, there's a lot of religion and even new age ego bashing. The religious ego bashing has been going on for a long time. And there's all sorts of people out there talking about how bad the ego is. You've got to get rid of it. And, you know, without going into a long, complex discussion on that, I, I teach my students that you, you have to realize the ego is absolutely a gift from God. It, it is that which allows us to differentiate subject from object. Mm -hmm. And without that differentiation, we cannot consciously experience love. There would be no way for me to say, I love you, because there would be no I and you without an ego. Like the child pees all over the floor or the couch because it thinks that's all part of its being. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think uh, one of the challenges we face is, is this sort of dark religious idea of destroying individuality, moving into, you know, I think Jung's work on individuation is very, very essential because it really helps us realize that becoming an individual gives us the power to really be conscious of our ability to give and receive love, but even as important is that we can become a co-creator in life. We can go from being a victim of the church or like you say, an unconscious fundamentalist to asking ourselves a bigger question. What, what really would enhance my life and bring more joy and more meaning into my life? And as we do that, we, 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 uh, we have that within us and therefore it's in our field. We're sharing it with people everywhere we go. And you've got so many people freaking out about, you know, the world's going to come to an end, the Christian apocalyptic view, a world war. But I tell my students, if, if you realize that by coming, becoming an individual and becoming whole, that you can actually understand the principle and the process and the creative forces of love and creativity, that you then at that time are conscious enough to actually leave the world a little better than you found it. And that for I think for most of us is a, a deep source of meaning. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sure. And I, again, we have to remember the ego is a functional complex. And when I use the word complex, I'm using it as a neutral term. It's a cluster of our history. It's a cluster of, of energy that's win, within us. Mm -hmm. If I call you Paul and you call me Jim, we call up out of all of our possible associations and ego identification. And that's, you know, useful and appropriate. And that, that complex's function, as I mentioned, is to help us execute in the world our, our plans. You know, we learn to tie our shoes, look both ways before we cross the street, get to work on time, things of that sort. That's the ego functioning. 
That's not a problem. If we don't have that ego functioning, we would be strictly living at the instinctual level and or able to unable to function in, in contemporary civilization. The problem yes. comes in the inflation of the ego, the fantasy that it's in charge, the fantasy that it's the boss. And all of the great religions had counseled against that, which, you know, was, quote, the sin of pride. Uh, yes. Use the term inflation because it, it means inflating beyond its legitimate capacity, which is the capacity as a servant, but a responsible right. servant. You know, you're responsible for how you drive your car. The laws of California say this is this is the speed limit, and here are the stop signs, and and it's the ego's function to observe that. It can violate that, but but at a price, and and so the ego is not the problem. It's it's under what influence it uh, falls. It could fall under the influence of of inflation, or the influence of any particular complex. So a, a, when a complex is activated in us, which which remember is a cluster of our history, right? We are in a state of possession. And in other words, our, our ancestors talked about, they recognized that people could act in strange ways, fits of rage or fall in love. And we talk about lovers being fools. Well, why are they fools? Well, when they're, when they're in that state of, of projected um, you know, fantasy onto the other, they're in an altered state of consciousness. And it's very real to them at the time. But outsiders and others could look at that and say, what a foolish choice, or don't you know what you're walking into, that sort of thing. And yes. Again, underneath all of that is, you know, the psychic functioning that's trying to see to the well-being of the individual. So what happens, you were talking before about the splitting between good and evil. A good example of that is the relationship of, of the ego to the body. You know, is, is the body a, a, a place of home? Is it a place of respect? Is it a place of vital energies or is it something to be uh, separated from, held off? And, you know, there's hardly anybody who does not carry a deep sexual wound, for example, because particularly if they've been exposed to certain religious traditions, you know, there's a splitting from the body. You know, the body's not evil. The body is nature naturing. And yes. We recognize that we're, con we're responsible for the consequences of our actions toward others, to be sure. But to see the body is in some way an enemy, and of course that's part of what is affecting a lot of the church scandals right now, is this effort to suppress what is in fact a living and natural function in service to an ideology. And people yes. are for their ideology, but you have to recognize there's a price for that, and that price doesn't go away. Nature always keeps the score, and nature shows up sooner or later. You know, one of the ways I address that with my students is I, I found uh, in one of Marie Louise von Franz's book a very good, uh, she diagrammed the, the psychic bridge or the bridge of the psyche in, on, on the high end, if you think of it like the chakras at the top end, you have that which is transcendent and immeasurable, and at the bottom end, which would be the red end of the chakra or the root chakra, you have that which is material, and so I explain that you know your body isn't just a bunch of physical matter it's actually interwoven and directed and infused with all levels of consciousness whether it be uh, unconscious subconscious conscious or the super conscious because none of those things can be differentiated just like you can't cut one color out of a rainbow with any with any clear demarcation and so i, I found that it really helps people to understand that the body is is like the condensation of consciousness in which we can have a tangible physical experience through the senses and experience what it is that we're producing with our elusive and invisible thought processes. Mm -hmm. You know, the famous um, paleontologist uh, Teilhard de Chardin said once, matter is spirit slowed enough for us to be able to see it. Yes. Which yes. I think is a very telling point. It's all one thing. Matter and spirit are simply ego concepts that split, and, and it can serve a function to help us differentiate aspects of the totality. But the totality is subsumed under the term psyche. You know, yes, it's, psyche is the totality of a being. The, tot the psyche is. I mean, stop and ask yourself for a moment. Uh, what's telling my toenails to grow? Uh, what's telling my stomach to digest breakfast? What's producing new cells in my body as old cells die and pass away? What's causing my emotions, etc., etc.? It's like I, I, the ego, <laughs> am not in charge of those functions. 
but there's some cluster, some center of energy within me that's managing these things. So the ego can stand in harmonious relationship to that or, or be separated from it and, and pay a price down the line. Yes, yeah, Steiner speaks quite extensively, uh, s literally stating that consciousness is the primary source of disease in people. And he explains how, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with his teachings, but he explains that the soul is a negative energy uh, relative to the physical body. And that when we think thoughts or have desires or, you know, judgments within ourselves, that the body and the nervous system has to go through a process in which the conscious energies are transformed into emotions and into hormonal responses. And because all of our glands, organs, and tissues are responding to that interface between the well, conscious input and the physical reaction, he said most people's consciousness or the ideas in their head are actually what's disabling their body and leading them to ill health. Sure. Well, and in other words, you know, the ego state can, again, be possessed by an idea, such as the body is evil, and I'll try to suppress it, or, or will, will be in service to an ideology such as uh, my value equals my material worth, and I put all my life energy into that, and I find myself depressed. Why, why is that the case, you know? Uh, it, it's where there's been a ego attitude or a psychic possession, if you will, and I'm using possession in quotes, Yes. Whereby I have separated myself from a healthy relationship with the entire organism. And again, you Which, term yes. the entire organism was really the psyche. And psyche is the Greek word for soul. You know, soul soul is the totality of the person. But this animal, and we are animals, is is more than just, you know, a reproducing and, and you know <laughs> eating and regurgitating animal. It's it's an animal that suffers disconnect from meaning. And, and more people's suffering arises out of disconnect from meaning than any other single causal factor. And it's, it's also sad for me as, as a guy who looks deeply into these things to see all this antagonist emotion and view and ideology toward the body because the body itself, I mean, if we even look at it scientifically, the body is a product of the entire universe. I mean, if you go right down to the atoms in your body or to the elements from the periodic table mm -hmm. to the elements of earth, water, fire, air. Uh, you know, I, I often tell people just do a simple exercise, write down how much of your body you think is earth, how much you think is water, how much you think is warmth or fire and how much you think is air. And then what do you, when you add all that up, it doesn't matter what the number is. There's usually nothing left in most people's conception. And I said, well, there you are. What you really are is not earth, water, fire, air, but you're that which can't be weighed or measured that's interacting with these elements to create the experience of life. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that to show them, you know, you have this negative orientation toward the body, but you love the sun. You might love being out on a night of the full moon, but you forget that the body you're wearing is the sun, the full moon, the stars, the planets, and all these things. And oftentimes I, I find that when they realize that it shifts them out of this sort of uh, egocentric programmed relationship with themselves into something more holistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might say it's all soul stuff just for our purposes here, no matter what form it takes, you know? Yes. It's in the growing of your toenails. It's in the digestion of your food products, etc. cetera. Um, that's, so, that's souls doing its job. So if I heard you right, you're saying, your definition or the way you use soul is it's the sum total of the experiences we're having within ourselves? Yes, but it's also in a sense that, that at the heart of this particular animal is the experience not just of instinct, um, but of the issues of meaning. When we are in relationship to something that is meaningful to us, we, we feel supported, energized, and purposeful. And when we disconnect from that, we suffer greatly. And that's when we get into drugs and alcohol and looking for ideologies or cultural surrogates that are going to allegedly fix that. Right. Now, I've done a lot of research on the soul and do, you know, I've been doing Tai Chi for like 17 years and meditating since I was a kid. My mother's uh, raised us in the tradition of Paramahansa Yogananda, the Self Realization Fellowship. So I got to spend a lot of time with monks and learned meditation early on. So I've done 
a, a lot of exploration within myself. But one of the things that I don't see, I've only probably got one or two books in my whole library, which is quite comprehensive, that actually explain the relationship between soul and spirit. Oftentimes, those two are used separately. I know in alchemy, they have uh, unique ways of explaining the relationships. I'm wondering if you could share what your view is mm-hmm. uh, on the interaction of or the how, how, how do you see soul and spirit interacting together or are they in your model part of two sides of the same coin? Well, first of all, remember, we're always speaking metaphorically because the human ego tends to think in terms of nouns. In other words, objects, when I talk about the ego or the talk about the, the psyche, we, we, we tend to objectify that. It's how we try to understand it and how do we stand in relationship to it when it's an object. But in doing that, you know, we've made a sign of it, as you were saying before. A symbol is really something that points beyond itself toward the mystery. So mm-hmm. understand that we're using these terms as metaphors. So spirit is really the energy that's available in the system. So when a person is depressed, something has has possessed a part of their spirit, stolen it, as it were. That's why Jung compared depth psychology to the shamanic tradition, because the shamanic healing practices of ancient cultures was the recognition that people would fall into a, a state where, where their spirit was absent or not available to them. And, and they believed some evil spirit had uh, captured it. And the shaman's uh, responsibility then was to enter into that imaginal state of that person, try to discern what, what agency or bad spirit had stolen that, and um, you know go wrestle with that or find out what that spirit needed to do to be cajoled to allow the energy to return, what compensation should, should occur. And he said that's actually a model of modern depth psychotherapy when we we find ourselves maybe caught in a depression or something like that and and then realize okay the spirit is not buoyant and and available the energy is robbed where it's not gone it's gone somewhere else and then we have again have to track it and figure out where it's gone yes i'm i'm actually uh, licensed through the native american council as a medicine man and spirit guide and for 15 12 15 years now i've been using uh, shamanic healing approaches and various plant medicines to conduct healing ceremonies. So I'm, I'm totally with you on everything that you're saying there. Um, and and I, I like what your definition is and your definition goes pretty much hand in hand with the alchemist. So I think that's beautiful too. Um, Jung uses the term self with a capital S E L F versus little S E L F. And I've actually read a number of books where even Jungians state the meaning of capital S-E-L-F differently. Some say that Jung equated it to God. Others say that he equated it to the world or our connection to the whole world. Could you bring some clarity between capital S-E-L-F and little self? Sure. First of all, the distinction, and we often in Jungian literature capitalize the self uh, to distinguish it from, say, myself, which is little s. Uh, the ego is the little s. That's who I think I am. That's, that's my concept of myself. But I am all these other functions and all these other mysteries of which we, I know very little, if anything at all. And, and you know, our, our ego always swims in mystery, but again, it thinks, it irrigates to itself the powers of understanding that uh, constitute a delusion in a way. But uh, in, in a sense, the, the, the self is the architect of the development of the organism. In other words, you could say the selfhood of the acorn is to become the oak tree. Now, it's at the mercy of all kinds of elements of fate. It has to depend on falling on the fertile ground, having enough light and moisture. But inside of every acorn is the potential of the, of the whole blossoming tree. And, and so it is for, for each of us. That's, that's the self as a verb, not as a noun. You, you can't have an MRI or a CAT scan and have the self show up or the soul show up. Uh, right. We were talking before about the soul. There were actually people who tried to experiment with a body just before death and immediately after so they could literally weigh the soul when it disappeared. And, uh, you know, of course, it, it, th- those were futile experiences because they were trying to literalize a metaphor. 
you know. Yes, but they did. They did actually show a weight difference, which I thought was interesting. It was a small, I don't know, it was ounces or something like that, but that might have been just gas, you know, air leaving the body. Absolutely. And, and moisture disappearing and so forth. But yeah. point, point being, uh, they, they were caught in the old business of ego literalization of those energies. And, you know, it's, it's best to think, it's not good English, but it's better to think of the self as a verb. The self is selving. Just to follow yes. the previous metaphor, the self is growing your toenails. That's part of its functioning. So the, the, the self is, if you will, is the blueprint and, and the enactor of the developmental pattern. Of course, from the standpoint of the ego, one of the mysteries of, of encountering the self is, is to realize how little we are in charge. That's why Jung said once encounters with the self are uh, typically experienced as defeats for the ego. Now, why would it be a defeat for the ego? Well, because the ego has appointed itself the boss. It thinks I'm in charge here. You know, I'm the, I'm I'm the head honcho, and 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 then the depression comes and says, "Oh no, you're not. We're just going to rob all of your energy." You know, it's like reaching in and taking your bank account. Now go spend something. You don't have to spend anymore, uh, or or even more telling, uh, the, the self includes our speeding toward our mortality and dissolution. And the ego says, well, wait a minute. I thought I was the boss there. You know, <laughs> but I, I had something to say about that. And, and no matter, you know, you know, maybe if I have more, more money, maybe if I have more power, maybe if I have more lines in my resume, um, you know, I'll be exempt from this. Well, guess what? It's not. Um, you're, you're, you're in the programming of the self. And it's, it's a mystery, not to nature, but to the ego when it separates itself. In other words, I... Whenever our, we could say neurosis is wherever we're aligned against nature, as we often are. And our biggest neurosis in Western civilization at this point is our attitudes towards aging and mortality. Because that means yes. we have a, a, an identification with our ego state and not with our nature. You know, um, I have a lot of... Uh experience with use of plant medicines or psychedelics and healing ceremonies. And uh, I imagine, you know, right now, this is the plant medicines are just booming all over the world. I mean, there's countless people going off into the jungle and mm -hmm. having ayahuasca and every other experience. But it, it, what I what I really feel, and I'm just curious if your your uh, your opinion on this, it, it what, what I really feel happens is that a properly run psychedelic ceremony gives you an authentic encounter with the self because it disables the ego's filtration system. Mm -hmm. Yet, if the if the dose is right, it leaves you with enough consciousness to realize, you know, you are connected to the stars, you are connected to the plants, and everything you thought was dead becomes very, very alive. So it's it, it's you know, in speaking in in uh, shaman speak or Native American speak, it's the plant spirits recognize that we're in trouble and they're coming to to kind of ground us in the truth of ourselves. Sure, I, I think on a far lesser level. The old phrase, in vino veritas, you know, when people have had a little too much to drink, they get belligerent, they get yes. depressed, they get to be the life of the party. And and the, the, the notion in vino veritas means in the wine, the truth is found. Because again, the same thing has happened. The strictures and filtration of the ego is relaxed. And up comes the bubbling aspects of the personality. They're always there. You know, that were there during the, the day before, but were, were sustained and contained, uh, you know, by, by ego and other outer uh, constrictors. And entangled in, in um, complexes. Yeah, certainly that too. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that you used wine as a, a descriptor there, because I don't know how familiar you are with Rumi's poetry, but he, he uses wine to describe God quite a lot. Sure, sure. Well, because, you know, again, there can be a dissolving of the ego boundaries and one can feel a sense of connection to, to something larger. That's, that's one of those impulses that is wanting to be expressed through a person that also can be, uh, you know, repressed. You know, wine historically was used in religious ceremonies. Yes. Um, the next one is individuation on our list of terms. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of things that could be said about that. But, you know, I, one of the things that was important to me is how much emphasis Jung put on individuation and how important it was. And not only how important it was to the individual, but to the family, to the tribe, to society, to the world, to culture. Could you 
encapsulate for us Jung's concept of individuation and, and share your thoughts on the importance of that today? Sure. It's, it, it's a very large subject, but individuation at heart means to the person who is progressively less divided against himself or herself. Um, and, and, you know, our central task is to not become loyal agents of the state or, or children our, our parents are going to be proud of. It's to become yourself in a non-selfish way. <laughs> Again, it's not about ego gratification or ego narcissism. It's actually finding a, a life as a kind of summons to service. What is it you're serving? Now, to, for example, let's say a person has been gifted with an artistic talent, but he or she lives in a culture which does not value that and may even repress it. Or one's born with a certain personality or sexual orientation or something like that. And, you know, you're, you're, you're summoned to be yourself in this world. You know, you're to serve that. Um, and it often will lead you to places of persecution or prejudice or difficulty or loss of understanding, even loss of family, as happens. So, Amen to that. Individuation is not about individualism. It's, it's about service to the soul. And the more one's in service to that, then, then the more one is, you know, a, more nearly a whole person. We don't achieve wholeness, not on this plane at least, but a more nearly whole person, a less divided person. That does not mean that we're spared suffering or aging and mortality or, um, the, you know, the persecution of others. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting little riddle that, that you've just described because the term individuation really orients one towards self. But as you've described, it's the, the, the fruit of that individuation is participating in the world, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's funny because the term individuation automatically makes a person who understands English think about an individual, but the ultimate product of that is somebody who is much more connected to the whole. That's right. In other words, it's, if you have a mosaic, every chip there is itself. And yet, without that selfness or that selfhood, it, it would diminish the totality of the mosaic. And he said specifically, he says, a person who has to follow his or her own star uh, often will appear to either be running away or, or, or at least disappearing from the collective. And he said that's a kind of burden or debt that is to be repaid by returning to the collective as a more developed person. That's what you have to share with your partners. That's what you have to share with your children. You know, That's inherently the hero's journey right there, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and that's why he said, for example, the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent. Because it, yes. the child's going to be stuck at that same level of development or be spending... Uh, one's time trying to get unstuck, either way, one's partly being defined by someone else's unfinished business than, than living the unfolding of one's own journey. Yes. Uh, another term that's used a lot in many circles today, uh, and there's a quite a wide variation of understandings on that. I know Jung, one of Jung's definition for an archetype was an empty form, but that leaves a person who hasn't done a lot of deep study, quite confused. For example, I've studied books by Jungian authors. I can't remember the one guy that I read. Uh, it's in my library, but he actually goes into chaos theory and quantum physics and describes archetypes as strange attractors. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would you encapsulate an archetype so that somebody who might not really have a grasp of that could mm -hmm. put their head around that? Well, the simplest way is to understand it means ancient or primal pattern. And it, you think about it, again, as a verb. It's not a received content. It's an energy system that's transmitted through the human system. It's, it's part of our instinctual life. Jung said, if all of humankind disappeared but for one couple who could reproduce the species, human culture would still evolve pretty much the way it has evolved. You know, you may or may not have the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers or not, but, you know, basic forms of culture would evolve because they've come from where? You know, they've come not from the gods, but from the unfolding of the human psyche. And so you, you think about the psyche as the way in which we pattern. Uh, it's, it's a way of providing order and pattern and a dynamic system 
to what otherwise would be chaos. In other words, life may be meaningless inherently, you know, atoms combining and, and uh, disassembling and so forth. But we come to it and we bring to it uh, this patterning process. So just to give a simple example, uh, the, the idea of completion or circularity. In other words, we pay attention to holidays. We pay attention to birthdays. You know, they're just arbitrary dates. They're just moments in a linear passage of time. But there's something in us that's looking for that vertical dimension that says, oh, this is an important day. This is, this is the holiday or this is, this is my birthday or something like that. Uh, again, it's, it's a patterning process. It's not a received content. So in, in talking about it as an empty form, it is that, but it's also a dynamic form. It's not, it's not static. In other words, let, let's just say the quest or the journey, which is an archetypal process of how we move through the stages of our life, and not just biologically, but socially and, and psychologically, psycho-spiritually. And so each of us has different forms in which that will show up. Now, you can have a dream tonight, and we all dream whether you remember them or not, that it was literally the dream that someone dreamt in the ancient world, except you might have an automobile in your car, and that person has a burrow, or that person might be walking. What's the archetype is, is not the specific content that comes out of the cultural and personal unconscious of the individual. It's, it's the form of the journey, of the departure, of the initiation, of the process of moving forward and being transformed. That's what the archetype is, not the content. Yeah, I think I think what really is helpful is looking at this as a verb, and and it seems that all the way through religion and back into the fundamentalist aspects of religions, there's a, a real almost addiction to nouning things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, because there's a certain security provided to the ego to understand, to stand in relationship, to maybe even to be in control of it, you see? And yeah. I think I'm, quote, being religious because I follow a certain creed or a certain practice. I'm not. I'm simply <laughs> caught in a complex. I don't realize that. I'm not li- in the presence of any living energy. I'm, I'm li- in captivated by an ego construct. The, the sort of the sad reality to that very process you've described is that in my observation, people who have not individuated tend to gravitate toward these fixed ideas and the people that give them a sense of security. Like whenever you see an ism like vegetarianism or Rastafarianism, oftentimes people are, that are eating vegetarian lifestyles are actually making themselves sick at a certain point because they're not getting enough amino acids to produce the hormones. And I've had to rehabilitate countless numbers of them. But what I see behind that is a deeper desire to be connected to a group of people that share some code of conduct so that they have an extended family, often uh, because they've come from very broken family relationships, they're searching for that family connection. But the, the, uh, the, the real thing that's missing is that they're not able to connect to the transcendent energy that's beyond the group that's more comprehensive and more whole than anything the group can provide as a series of nouns. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is why Jung said once, I'm Jung, thank God, and not a Jungian, because he was not wanting to be an ideology. He wasn't wanting to be an ism. He was simply saying, here are some ideas and discoveries I've made about the human psyche, and here's some tools to address your relationship to your life and your relationship to the unconscious. And um, here, borrow them, use them. Uh, take them and, and, and make them work for you. And if they help you, fine. And if they don't, discard them for better tools. So I think, you yes. know, in, in those moments, we remember what was the whole point of this rather than try to rest easy in the ism, whatever it may be. Well, yes. And, and along that line, Jesus wasn't a Christian, Buddha wasn't a Buddhist, and Lao Tzu wasn't a Taoist. Sure, sure. And that's why the famous Buddhist statement, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. In other words, don't, don't, don't become an ideology. Understand what Buddha was trying to attempt. Yes, it's interesting that from my studies, one of Buddha's last requests to his students was, please do not make statues of me. And research shows he is the most statued man in the world. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. Probably so. That's, but see, that's the ego because it says, all right, 
when I have that statue, I have something to relate to consciously, and, and in some way that gives me a certain, um, uh, you know, familiarity perhaps, maybe even a sense of ego comfort. And, and that's, yeah. that's about me, not about what the spirit of uh, Gautama was. And I think, I think personally that can be very beautiful if it's used as a symbol. But sure. as you know, you know, a good example of the confusion of, of a symbol is if Jesus really was a human being on the planet, by all definitions, he was a Middle Eastern man with dark hair and brown skin. But you see Christians painting him up as a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes everywhere. And then telling everybody that this is what Jesus wants. If you don't take him as your savior, you're going to burn in hell. Everybody else is wrong. So now they've turned him into a sign. And I think that just kills the transcendent power of Jesus right there. Well, of course it does. And, and you're right to say that's when you move from a symbol to a sign. And that's all in service to either ego comfort, ego fantasy of management, or, or being in a complex at a particular time, because it's awfully comforting to be able to know that I'm right and you're wrong about something, you see. And, and that's the inherent insecurity of the ego. That's why people band together and form isms. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the deep paradoxes I often have to address with Christians that I'm working with either as students or, and, and this could be any religion, but it's more common in Christianity because of me being in the United States. But Christianity is was hell bent against idolism and got you know killed countless pagans for idol, idol worship. Yet there they are, the leading practicers of idolism. Well, when it, whenever a certain idea or value or experience gets codified or institutionalized, it risks becoming an idol because your energies are devoted to that rather than that which it's pointing to. That's the, that's the whole point. And remember, a symbol is, is an image or an experience that points beyond itself towards something essentially mysterious, and by definition is going to remain mysterious. Yes, this is the Buddhist saying from the Master, don't look at the finger pointing at the moon, look at the moon. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And this this conversation leads beautifully into my next category I wanted to discuss with you, ethics versus morals. I personally view ethics as codes of conducts that may or may not be moral and morals as codes of conduct that are life affirmative. I tell people when I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, I had about a 400 page manual that told me who to kill, who not to kill and what to do if I captured them. And that's an ethics manual, but it's not moral whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, you know, morality is a code is defined by any group. And it, it often says more about the group than it says about anything else. And, and you have to reach difficult points in your life where you have to decide, is there something higher than morality? Do you realize what a slippery slope that is? What it's, it's really <laughs> calling for is because any complex could sort of take over and say, well, I have the right to do this because I'm right here. And yes. our egos easily, easily talked into those kinds of shabby arguments. But underneath that is the question, what is the higher value here? And, and what is this about? And, and, and for example, civil disobedience is based on the notion that I'm trying to serve a value, I think, higher than the code of my culture. If, if sitting in at, at, at a lunch counter is wrong by the codes of my neighborhood, as it once was, simply because I have a different color skin, then, then I, I have an obligation to testify to something larger than that code of conduct. And in doing so, I know I pay a penalty. You know, I suffer civil, civil penalty and perhaps worse as a result of doing that. Yes. Now, we're running short on time, and, and I have several other questions I wanted to get to, but we won't be able to do that today, which is fine, because we've had a really beautiful opportunity to clarify some of the things I think are most important for the further discussion to really be accurately, accurately or uh, effectively interpreted. Um, in my studies of myth, I came across a definition that I thought was really beautiful, and I wanted to post it to you and ask you if you could give your interpretation of it. The definition was myth is something that's happening all the time. No, myth is something that's never happened, but is happening all the time. Sure. Could you share how, how you would interpret that? Sure. You know, myth represents some sort of encounter with or form in which our values are embodied. And so, you know, you can read popular culture, read 
popular m movies and, and, and read popular novels and watch television and so forth. And you get an outline of the sensibility of, of people. That's, that's, that's a kind of way of taking the temperature of a time and a place and a culture. Uh, initially, the function of myth was to serve two or four basic functions, and that was to link one to the transcendent energies. Uh, that is to say, link the ego. For example, the first to the cosmos. Is this a organized universe versus a chaotic universe? And that's what the word uh, a cosmos means, is order versus chaos. Uh, if so, who or what are the orderers? That is to say, who are the gods? Why are we here? What are we to do here? Whither do we go after this life? Th those questions don't go away. A person may have stopped asking them, but they're still being asked in the unconscious, and they'll show up in people's somatic disorders, emotional disorders, or projections into popular culture. The second order of mystery is how do I live in harmony with nature? And we know we've screwed that up because of our very much so crises, you know. Thirdly, is the mystery of belonging, the mystery of tribe. To whom do I belong? Who are my people? And and do I feel a sense of home or purpose or connection to to others? And what governs the codes of our relationships? And and fourthly is you know how does the my ego stand in relationship to the the soul? And what are my what is my compass? How do I find my way through the thicket of choices that I have to face? Now, when peoples have had the privilege of having energy charged images that link, link them not just in a conceptual way, but in a felt experiential way to these orders of mystery, they had a sense of locus, a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, grounding, a sense of belonging, a meaning. sense of being part of a, a part of meaning, yes, part of a larger story. And we all need to feel some part of a larger story. And, and when we have those disconnects, then, of course, one's left to the resources of secular culture, or as, as Jung said, we often have to develop our, our own personal mythological journey, you know, our own voyage through the uh, dark night of the soul, as it were. Yes. And so if I'm hearing you correctly, the something that never happened is the transcendent energies of the cosmos and the gods. And what's happening all the time is the either authentic exploration of that or the program beliefs as an enactment of what somebody has interpreted that to be. Well, sure. And each one of us has to approach that in our very personal ways. And if we simply relinquish that summons and that accountability to the culture, then we're creatures of our time and place and nothing more. And that will either serve us or fail us as the case may be. But if we understand, as Jung pointed out, the, the burden for that and the, the, the gift and dignity of that has shifted by and large from the collective to the shoulders of the individual now. If you're able and willing to take it on, this gives your whole life a depth and purpose that um, you know is irreplaceable. Well, there's so much more I could talk to you about. I want to value your time. You're an important human being to me. And... Uh, I really, really very much enjoyed sharing with you. I think we clarified a lot of very, very important things. I want to share that uh, I've been exploring your Jung uh, master classes that you referred Oksana to me, and uh, we are going to um, offer a special uh, for people to get on those master classes at the end. Penny will, will share that in a minute. So uh, I began studying the tracking the gods because I really – thought it was a beautiful way for me to get even deeper into the teachings of your book. And it's a very, very well produced system and course that they have there. So for any of you that have been as excited as I am about speaking with Dr. Hollis, he has a beautiful masterclass at Jung Masterclasses that you'll hear about in just a minute. Uh, Dr. Hollis, where can people find out more about you, your work, your books, or any services that you may offer? Well, I'm in private therapy as well as administration with the Young Society of Washington. So, and I'm pretty jammed up, but uh, I do travel and I do speak. And that schedule, uh, uh, which people, it's mostly young societies across the country, uh, is on my website, jameshollis.net. And of course, Amazon or most bookstores will be carrying the book. So uh, that's it's as simple as that. Well, I really appreciate it. And I just want to say for those of you listening, if you just go on Amazon, and type in James Hollis, 
uh, you will see a lot of books. And, and Dr. Hollis is a very clear, very lucid writer. He does a very good job of taking complex union terms that often take quite a lot of study and uh, practice to get clear in your head. And he makes them understandable in ways that very few people do. So Dr. Hollis, you're a gift to the world. And I look forward to any opportunity that we can uh, share in the future for going deeper into some of these very important issues on Living 4D with Paul Check. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It's been a privilege to be with you. And you've, you've provided some very thoughtful questions yourself. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And look forward to uh, any opportunity we can do it again. All right. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Dr. James Hollis. You can find Dr. Hollis online at www.jameshollis.net. To enroll in Dr. Hollis's course, Tracking the Gods, that Paul recommended in the podcast, please visit tiny.cc forward slash tracking the gods. That's tiny.cc forward slash tracking the gods. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living 4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's blog at checkinstitute.com forward slash blog.